Hi guys, here's um this we're starting for three now. Um, so you should have already turned in your chapter two test if you have not done so yet or taken it, let me know. Um, but chapter three first starts out with exponential functions. So this entire chapter is going to deal with exponential, natural log, and logarithmic. Um so I have everything written out so I can just kind of talk about it and then you can kind of write and listen along. So when we're talking about an exponential function, what that looks like is where we have our constant or number in our base and our variable and our exponent. So A is representing any real number. Okay, so I can have one, two, 5.7, any number can be um, in our base except A cannot equal zero and it also must be larger than zero. Um, so we, again, we're not having fractions down there. So, or not, sorry, not fractions. We're not having um, negative numbers in our base. Um, we can have fractions, but um, no matter what, when we're talking exponential, it makes sense that it's because our variable is in our exponent. What these functions look like is um, we have this curve that has an asymptote um, horizontally. The standard function or the parent function is going to have one that's along our x-axis. So the function hugs this x-axis and then goes up. Um, when it's a positive exponent, negative exponents are going to mean that we start high and then come down and hug that x-axis. So not only do we see these with any number in our base, but we also see these functions with a base of e. So e is a number. Um, that you can go ahead and find in your calculator and I'll show you where you find it. It's always above this division key. So you're going to have to press the second button to get to it, but it's this tiny little E above our division sign. If you were to click on it, it would tell you that it's an irrational number of repeating decimal of 2.718281828 and it's just a, a, um, after that. So it's kind of like the number pi, um, if you want to think of it that way. Therefore, since we can never um, get an accurate representation of it just by trying to insert the decimal, we have a number or a key for it in our calculator. Um, after this point, it doesn't exactly repeat that way, but that's that pattern right away. I would like you to avoid, um, some teachers in the past I've heard have, not at this school specifically, but I've heard, I've been with other teachers that, that you get, that let you use 2.7. I don't like that because the rest of these decimals will make a difference eventually. So make sure you're figuring out how to find that E button in your calculator. If we're talking about um, a function, a net exponential function with a base of E, that's gonna be the natural exponential function. Um, and again, same kind of curve here, where we're just starting low, hugging that x-axis, and then jumping up. So the reason also um, that these functions look the same, one thing you can see is when we talk exponential, it's where they start low and then they drastically increase very quickly. Or they start high and they drastically decrease very quickly. So let's talk about like a specific real world example of this. Um, we can relate this back to the coronavirus. So if we're thinking of COVID-19 cases, um, Let's say I were to get sick, but then I'm one positive case. Then I'm around my husband, I'm around my mom, I'm around my friends. Let's say I've, I just was in contact with maybe 10 people, close contacts in the last 10 days. Now those 10 people are sick. So this jumped from one case to 10 cases or 11 cases total within a short period of time. So now we can say that my 10 friends are sick. Well, they're each around 10 people in close contact, like just as a random number, right? Some give or take a little bit there. Um, but now their 10 close friends or family are sick. So that now increases to about 100. So within three levels, between me getting sick, my close friends and family getting sick, their close fr friends and family getting sick, we went from one person to 10 people um, to 100 people, okay, so, and even after that, because you have to add on the last numbers, but what I'm saying here is this, this is going to be representative, representatives of things that take a drastic increase or a drastic decrease, 
Some other examples would be half-lives of um, certain medicines um, or even just certain elements um, that you've learned about in science. Um, when we're talking about increasing, that would be interest rates, right? So let's say I went and applied for like a really crappy loan and they said I have an interest rate of like 23%. I might take out a loan today that is like a hundred bucks and then tomorrow it's already increased it like but depending on how it's um compounded once that 23 um percent interest is added now i owe more like a hundred and twenty or something like that and then it just keeps increasing and increasing and increasing until that amount is just skyrocketed from the hundred dollars that i took out to begin with so those are some real life examples of exponential functions um the when we're talking exponential, basically what we need to discuss is all real life applications. So the two real life applications that I specifically want to talk about, um, first is compound interest. So there's two different ways that interest gets compounded. Let's look at the first, so don't look at this one. Let's look at just this first example first. So continuously compounding um, is one form of interest rates. So if you're having um, continuous compounding, that's going to be A equals, people like to call it PERT to try to remember it, but it's P times E to the RT. This is where P is going to be our principal, R is our rate, T is time. So um, principal is going to be, like say I went today and I put $100 into um, some kind of stock. P is my principal. That's the $100 that I put in. The rate is going to be the interest rate of how it's going to grow over time. So generally, these numbers are pretty low because I'm letting the, the bank keep my money, but they're not going to give me a ton of money for doing so. So they get to keep my $100 in exchange for that. They might um, give me an interest rate of something even as low as 2%. So that means um, depending on how much it's compounded, I gain 2% onto my $100 that I gave them. And then time is going to be for how long. So a lot of banks um, or different investment opportunities will say that you at least have to keep that money in there for a year or 11 months, sometimes five years. Um, you get docked down on a penalty. So you would have to pay a penalty for taking that money out earlier than you said you were going to because the bank is taking that money and saying we get to keep this for X amount of months or X amount of years and then we have to come back up with it to give that money back. Okay, so that's continuously compounding. That means every second of every day you're compounding um, your money and getting interest paid to you every single day. Specific compounding be if your bank says or your whatever you're investing your money into says they're going to compound quarterly. That would be four times a year. Okay, when we're talking about the business world, quarterly is something that's referred to in general. That's how the business world goes. Um, they split that year up in different quarters, and that's how like tax brackets are broken down. Um, so generally, this is a pretty common one. Monthly is also one. So at the end of every month, they'd compound your interest, and you could pay that interest onto that account. Daily is another one. Obviously, that would happen 365 days a year. Other ones are annually, which happens once a year. Maybe biannually happens twice a year, and so on. There's so many different specific kinds of compounding. This is the um, kind of formula or whatever that you would use to describe that. So again, P is the principal. That's what you're taking to the bank. That's the money that you're putting in um, to gain interest on. T is standing for the number of years that you're doing this for. And then R is the interest rate, and how many times a year is it getting compounded? So let's do an example. Um, a total of $900 is invested at an annual rate of 2.5% compounded annually. We wanna find the balance in the account after five years. Okay, so I have $900, I'm taking this to the bank, I'm letting them keep it for five years. I'm compounding annually at a rate of 2.5%. So first off, which formula do I need to use? I'm not compounding continuously, so I am compounding a specific amount of 
one time a year. So we're going to use this A equals P times 1 plus R over N to the N T. A is going to stand for the amount also that I have after all of this is done. So principal, I'm taking $900 to the bank today. The one always stays. My interest rate is 2.5%. Keeping in mind that we don't plug percentages into an equation, we plug in decimals. So we need to write this 2.5% as a decimal. So a little bit of decimal to percentage conversion, or percentage to decimal conversion, we move the decimal one, two to the left. So this is actually going to be 0.025%, or not percent, sorry, 0 0.025 as a decimal. So we put that over how many times my compounding in, or how many times my compounding? I'm compounding annually. Number of times a year is then one. And now this is to the one times, for how many years am I doing this? Five years. So order of operations tells me I need to do what's inside my parentheses first. Anything divided by one is just itself. So I'm going to have 1.025 to the fifth power. Now I need to do exponents. So I'm going to take 1.025 to the fifth power. And I get 1.1314. I'm going to just go ahead and multiply that number by 900 because I know that that's what I need to do. Oopsie. Okay. So I end up with a equal 1,018 and 20, uh, we'll say 27 cents. Okay, this is the amount that I will have after a year. So very clearly, I mean, it was worth it. I gave them $900. Hopefully, I didn't need that $900 for the next five years. And I gained $118, basically. So just keeping in mind, that the less amount you give, the less amount you get back. But if this money was just gonna burn a hole in my pocket for the next five years, might as well make some money off of it. But it just goes to show you, you don't make a ton at a time unless you're investing a significant amount of money, which even $900 is a significant amount, but not in um, the interest world. All right, so another example, we went to, I can get this done. We want to let Y represent a mass in grams of radioactive stronium whose half-life is 29 years. The quantity of stronium present after T years is represented by Y equals 10 times one half to the power of T divided by 29. So our first question, A, is what is the initial mass? So first things first, they're giving us the exponential function. Um, that represents the half-life of this element of stronium. So one that we, we don't have to make this on our own. When they give it to us, we just have to figure out how we're using it. So what is initial mass? T is um, obviously representing years, um, or yeah, T, is, T years is represented by, so T is standing for time in years. So if I want to find the initial mass, how many years have passed? The initial mass is what I'm starting with before I start anything. So here, t is going to have to equal zero because I've done nothing. No time has passed. No amount of years have passed. So y equals 10 times 1 half to the 0 over 29. Hopefully, you're like, ding, ding, ding. I remember this from my exponent properties. Um, First, zero divided by anything is zero. So we have 10 to the one half 
or 10 times 1 half to the 0, anything to the 0 power equals 1. So I have 10 times 1, which is just 10. So 10 grams um, was present at first. I know it's grams because they told me that in the beginning. So how much of the initial mass is present after 80 years? So again, we just have to figure out how are we going to use this formula. T is representing years, so 80 is going to go in for T. And you can go ahead and plug this in to your calculator. Oh, sorry, I did something wrong in mine. I was trying to figure out why I was getting such a big number because I knew I shouldn't have been. That was my bad. Okay. Um, so 10 times 1 half. I took it all multiplied together. All right. You should be getting... Something that's going to round to 1.48. So y equals 1.48 grams. So after 80 years, I still have about one and a half grams left of stronium when I started with um, 10. Okay. So this is all for 3.1, um, you're going to see, like, there's no one way to say this is exactly what you do. There's no exact process when dealing with these. Just kind of read the problem and figure out where to go from there based on the information um, that we have. Okay, that's all I have for you today.